to say is wow <laughs> this is simply the fantastic place that we are so privileged to share as God's people of this area and really the story of the gospel transfiguration comes alive in this place I won't build tents here and stay here. <laughs> thanks be to God for this awesome gift to God's people. And thanks be to God for the ministry of Center for Spiritual Formation, Ross and other staff and board of directors and congregations and pastors and so many friends and God's people who are in partnership with this awesome place of ministry. When we were children, our parents would instruct us in how to live safely in this world. Most of these instructions were very simple, but significant and essential if we were to remain safe and alive. We can all remember some of those instructions. Look both ways before you cross the street. Never chase a ball into the street without looking. Don't talk to strangers. Be careful. Pay attention. Don't fight. Remember to say thank you and please. And a myriad of more venial bits of wisdom. Our parents, teachers, and elders offered these reminders because they loved us and wanted what was best for us. It was part of what it meant to live in a safe and caring world. Another of those nuggets of advice was in regards to railroad crossings. One of the signs at a railroad crossing was, stop, look, and listen. We all know the advice that is implied in those few words. Stop. Don't assume before you or your car crosses the railroad track that nothing is coming. Look in both directions to be certain that the track is clear. Finally, listen. Perhaps you might not see the train coming, but the sound of the train's whistle might alert you to a fast approaching train. Unfortunately, every so often, we read about someone who didn't adhere to that life-saving advice, and either they or their car were hit by the train. In most cases, the outcome resulted in the loss of life. I appreciate that simple instruction, stop, look, and listen, as it relates to railroad, railroad crossing. And I believe that the same instruction has some significant implications to our spiritual disciplines and well-being. So the first word, stop. One of the realities of life is that most of us are consumed by doing. As I have come to learn about and to appreciate the Pennsylvania German culture, I have been told that one of the values of this culture is an emphasis upon doing, working, and achieving. We know that it is indeed a powerful and positive force to sustain, improve, and enrich our lives. However, we also know that the time to work must be balanced with the time to stop working and take rest. No one would last long just working without taking a break. God understood the value of taking Sabbath. After six days of creative acts, God stops. We read in the scripture that God rested on the seventh day as Sabbath. Our Lord Jesus Christ also knew the value of stop doing ministry at times to take time by himself. We read in the Gospels how Jesus would depart from the crowds and go and seek a place of quiet solitude. He would often go to the other side of the lake in order to be restored. Today's Gospel reading of Mark illustrates that after a very occupied day of ministry, 
Jesus practiced taking time to stop. He started his day with teaching in the synagogue. Then he had healed a man with an evil spirit. Then he visited the home of Peter and Andrew and healed Peter's mother-in-law, who was in bed with fever. That evening, even after sunset, people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, the Bible said. And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons. It was indeed a very exhaustive day with so much demanding ministry done. However, early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went up to a solitary place. The demands of ministry were always upon Jesus with intensity and urgency. Jesus would have been easily consumed by works, but he did not allow it to happen to him when he stopped doing things and took time to be alone with God periodically, intentionally, and habitually. Disciples didn't seem to take Jesus' time out very well. When they didn't see him around, they didn't leave him alone. They looked for him until they found him in a solitary place, and they exclaimed, everybody's looking for you. They seemed to be annoyed and cranky by Jesus' absence when the demand on him was so great. Mark didn't report it, but the disciples may well have said to Jesus, why in the world are you here by yourself when all the people want you so badly? Before they said, everybody's looking for you. Jesus responded to them in an unexpected way. He replied, let's go someplace else. He then left behind a large crowd who wanted him. Indeed, his practice to take time to be by himself made a difference in setting his agenda and priorities. Jesus knew that his spiritual life and thus his ministry would suffer seriously without the periodic practice of stopping to be alone with God. As far as a healthy spiritual life is concerned, Jesus demonstrated that keeping this practice is a must, not an optional luxury. If it was so to him, it must be even more to us that we have to do it with intention, intensity, and focus. My native country, South Korea, is known for the fast-paced way of doing things. Bali Bali, which means fast, fast, is one of the most frequently used phrases among Korean people. Everyone is expected to do everything fast. The non-stop and fast and furious pace of doing things may help the companies like Samsung or LG produce and sell lots of smartphones and other electronic products. It may make good business sense, but does not make good spiritual sense. As the current computer culture promotes the lifestyle of the faster the better, and things around us move faster and faster, we must learn how to slow down and stop and be still for the sake of sanity and the well-being of our souls. The message from God is clear. Be still and know that I am God. The time to stop is one of the most significant God moments that we've been looking for. The space to be still is one of the most promising places where God has been waiting for us. Amen? Amen. The second word, look. A few months ago, I had an opportunity to revisit some words by Robert Fulgham from his well-known book, All I Really Need to Know, I Learned in Kindergarten. How many of you read that book? Yeah, many of you. So it's a revisit, some of the words that he wrote. I quote, I realized that I already know most of what's necessary to live a meaningful life, that it isn't all that complicated. I know it and have known it for a long time. 
living it, well, that's another matter. Here's my credo. Share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess. Don't take things that aren't yours. Say you are sorry when you hurt somebody. Wash your hands before you eat. Flush. <laughs> Warm cookies and cold milk are good for you. Live a balanced life. Learn some and think some and draw and paint and sing and dance and plan and walk every day some. Take a nap every afternoon. When you go out into the world, watch out for traffic. Hold hands and stick together. Be aware of wonder. Remember the little seed in the paper cup. The roots go down and the plant goes up and nobody really knows how or why, but we are all like that. Goldfish and hamsters and white mice and even the little seed in the cup, they all die. So do we. And then remember the Dick and Jane books and the first word you learned, the biggest word of all, look, end quote. What a better world it would be if we all learned to share, to put things back, to restore the earth, to care for one another, to take naps. In other words, practice stop. To eat warm cookies and drink cold milk I might add some fresh fruits and vegetables every day <laughs> to hold hands and to look. For a child, to look would mean to see the world with the eyes of curiosity, imagination, wonder, and even magic. It would mean to discover something marvelous in the mundane, extraordinary in the ordinary, big in the small, significant in the negligible, and even supernatural in the natural. In our spiritual disciplines, the word look is a call to see the world with the eyes of faith. Jesus taught his disciples and the crowds by having them look. Look at the birds of the air. See the lilies of the hill, field. With the eyes of faith wide open, our spiritual life comes alive as we look and perceive the living presence, the loving heart, and the caring hands of God magnified, manifested, and expressed all over the place, all around us. The eyes of faith also enable the beholder to look and see what God sees. We hear the words of God in Isaiah, see, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. The eyes of faith enable us to look at new possibilities in the world. They enable us to see beyond the gravity of the situation and perceive the healing and hope emerging. They enable us to see the heart of God and convince us that love is the power that overcomes the world. Indeed, our spiritual journey is about responding to these words of God's invitation. Do you see what I see? So God's people, let's look. Let's keep our, our eyes open wide until we perceive a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland until we see what God sees. Let the church say amen. Amen. Then there is the last word, third word, listen. Jesus once lamented, though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. We all have had the experience of knowing people who really have the gift or have developed the ability to listen to us. It is amazing how these individuals are so affirming, assuring, and grace-filled that they make us feel that we are the only one around at the moment 
and that they can enter into our life. Then there are other individuals who quickly dismiss us and we really wonder if they have an ability or a desire to enter into our story. One of the attributes that I like most about Jesus was his ability to listen and understand. He was willing to go to Zacchaeus' house in order to hear him tell his story and learn about his yearning to live as a child of Abraham. How about the Samaritan woman at the well? Jesus truly knew her because he really heard her story and understood exactly her pain. How about the man hung on the cross beside Jesus? Jesus even then heard him during his last hours on the cross. How many times have we failed to really listen to someone and thereby miss out on what they were telling us and thus fail to hear the voice of God through them. There is a story told about a farmer who went to the big city to visit his cousin. They were walking down on the main city streets and the farmer felt overwhelmed as he was pushed and shoved by the huge number of people walking by. The city sounds were loud and noisy and he could hardly hear himself think or his cousin speaking to him. All of a sudden, the farmer stopped and walked a few feet over to a small patch of weeds that would be grass, and he stooped down to pick up a cricket. The farmer's cousin was astounded by how his relative heard the cricket amid all the noises. Similarly speaking, as the story goes, another worker dropped a coin on the sidewalk and several people immediately stopped and proceeded to pick it up. To what are our ears attuned to? The sounds of the heartbeats of God or those noises that bury us in the worries of the peripheral things of the world. One of the most powerful phrases in the Bible comes from the mouth of King Zedekiah when he asked Jeremiah this question, is there any word from the Lord? In other words, he asked Jeremiah, has God spoken to you recently? To listen is the call to be as attentive as possible so that even the small gentle whisper of God would not be missed. It is also the call to be ready to say, as Samuel did, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So we ask of ourselves, do we take time to listen? Have we heard God's voice recently? My brothers and sisters in Christ, some of the most important truths and lessons you and I will ever receive come in simple but profound truth. Are you and I taking time to stop, look, and listen? Thanks be to God that the Center for Spiritual Formation offers a time and space for us to do exactly that. Indeed, no one leaves this place the same way as he or she came in because they encountered our God face to face as they learn and practice to stop, look, and listen on this holy ground. In the name of the God, the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. Amen.